um, the extent to which they're being treated respectfully uh, by the medical community. We would be focusing on their the sense to which they uh, see themselves as involved in research, and if they say they're not, we would then continue with them in a discussion of how would you feel about it and what would you think about it and things of that sort. Uh, we, uh, on the issue of whether indeed there are some potential uh, opportunities for harm that I've glossed over, you're right. You know, it's, it's, it's a mistake to say that there's no conceivable way in which someone might come away from an interview like this feeling bad, for example. Uh, there's a higher likelihood in my experience that they would come away feeling good, but they could come away feeling disturbed as a result of the process of being asked to reflect about when they were asked, you know, now that I think about it, um, I really didn't get a chance to um, um, talk to my family members before I said yes, and you could stir up feelings of retrospective uh, anxiety, guilt, whatever. So you're right, that could happen. I, guess, uh, um, I can't help but take a note of Henry's concerns, but with one caveat. And that is, often we learn a great deal if we learn about the, the, the uh, context in which patients exist. For example, prisoners often consent, not because we take them through all these informed consent processes, but because they're bored, right. uh, which tells us a great deal. But we can only find that out by spending time, I think, talking to them about how boring their existence is. And one of the things that was so powerful about that is that you could see how both parents and members of the school That's right. um, that might react to being treated in what they thought was a respectful way, given the conditions in, mm. that existed. So no, it's, you're, you're quite, I mean, it cuts it's, both ways. It, it does mm. cut both ways. And the art is to construct an interview that allows you to understand the experience and the context in which the experience is being lived. So you wouldn't go immediately to tell me, are you a research subject? You'd have to start with, tell me something about how long you've been ill and what brings you here and how you got to Oshkosh Tertiary Medical Care Facility. And most of that data then becomes not data that we report, but data that is useful in understanding what we then hear later. And also to get the person comfortable to start talking. You, you have to begin a process. It's a dialogue and trust has to be established to get the information that's valid. We're going to need to call it quickly, but Eli I, and then Henry Duncan, I think. Well, I just want to ask you, uh, how many uh, research subjects do you expect to interview? The, the uh, fantasy is that we would have uh, 200 patients interviewed. How many research subjects? I w well, my guess is that my, half of them might be research subjects. I think you're, you're overestimating by a factor of 10. I think you're talking about if you just take people at random mm -hmm. in, the, in the waiting room, the chance of hitting a, a research subject in a busy institution that does a lot of research is probably in the neighborhood of 5%. Now, if you're prepared to deal with that number... Well, that's, that's certainly worth checking out, Eli. Maybe. I mean, if that's, that's not my intuition, but you're more experienced than I am, so we need to go back and take a look at that. You know, it's, it's certainly of interest to me to, talk to, to me to talk to people who are not research subjects to see if they rightly understand that they're not research subjects. So I certainly don't think it's a well, loss. With, with, right, with the issue, the, but you're yeah, right, you have to have a certain a number of It's a issue as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Are, we, are you going to get the kind of yield Right. that you're expecting. I, I, I think you're going to have a problem. Well, what we can do is we can, we can pursue that one and we can establish with the centers that we would be, see, whose cooperation we would seeking indeed what proportion of their outpatients in radiation oncology are on protocol. And if it turns out that it's 2% or 5% or 8%, uh, that would be problematic. Uh, it would be devastating. In fact, there would be no point in proceeding. I think it's fine if half the people, in fact, are off protocol because it would be interesting to talk to them and see if if they think just because they're at Oshkosh, famous tertiary medical care facility, that they must be on protocol. But you're right, it would it not do at all if it only, only talked to 10 people who are actually on protocol. That would be no, no good. The only institution in the country that would have a high proportion of research patients is the NCI. Because they, they still bat 80 or 90 percent. But nobody else does. Because people are sent there specifically for research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's do this. It sounds as if uh, we need to do more homework on this particular one. So why don't, if I'm going to take it that the, we've already approved the oral histories, providing the experts tell us the oral histories can be done validly. We have approved the review of the current proposals. The, those are major steps forward. That gives the ethics subcommittee and the staff working on those topics lots to do.
We will investigate further uh, the kinds of issues that Eli has raised and all of the other technical and not so technical questions with respect to the patient interviews and revisit that at the end of the, at our second July meeting and reach closure then. We can't hang on beyond that and actually have a prayer of doing it. So if that's all right with the committee, we'll revisit that one and decide for sure if in our second July meeting it's either going to happen or it's, we're going to try to make it happen or we're going to bag it. Is that all right? With that, we can stop for lunch. The, the scope committee then can come in after lunch. We will rearrange, we will now furiously try to rearrange the um, agenda so we can get three subcommittee reports in after lunch. So let's try and do that. The Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments met Tuesday to discuss federal tests on people. Among those speaking, Yale Law Professor Jay Katz. We'll return to this discussion in a moment, but first, some program information. Sunday night, Talk Radio Week continues. At 10 Eastern Time, a live simulcast of LiveLine with host Howard Kurtz. The show airs on Washington, D.C. radio station WRQX. That's Sunday night here on C-SPAN 2 and on our companion network C-SPAN, beginning at 10 Eastern Time, 7 on the West Coast. Live from Newport, Rhode Island, a C-SPAN school bus special you'll see highlights from the first nationwide tour of the bus. Historic sites, presidential libraries, and examples of technology in education. And staff involved in the 28,000-mile bus trek talk about their experiences and impressions of the country. Also, we'll preview the 94-95 tour, which got underway this month. A C-SPAN school bus special. Monday, live from Newport, Rhode Island, at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, Five Pacific. For 15 years, C-SPAN has offered cable television viewers a front row seat to timely public affairs events. C-SPAN is funded entirely by America's cable television companies as a public service. Here's a look at the program schedule for the next several hours. All times listed are Eastern. In just a moment, we'll return to the meeting on human radiation testing. After that, a debate between candidates seeking the British Labor Party leadership. That's followed by The Morning Show from radio station WWRC in Washington, D.C., featuring a debate between the city's candidates for mayor. And at 3 a.m., a panel discussion on race and the justice system. That's a look ahead at programming for the next several hours. We now return to a meeting on federal radiation experiments. This meeting was held Tuesday by a group called the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. We could just, I think we have almost everyone. Reed is still not here. Ken is in the hallway. Come, Ken. Okay. We're going to start. We're going to try to get, we're going to redo it. All right. We have a realigned agenda, which Anna and I worked at or on at the end of the session, which is gone. So we have to reconstruct it. But the room is rearranged nicely. I think this is, from my point of view, it's much better. I don't know. Isn't this better? We should just say this is the, this makes you feel more connected. Pardon? I don't know. <laughs> All right. We are going to 
rearrange the agenda a bit to try to get three subcommittee reports in this afternoon. The session, the, the time devoted to my walking us through the draft outline, which is for your consideration, will be shortened. We are going to revisit it tomorrow. So it's basically, I'm going to walk you through the document in a much shorter compass of time. You can go home and go home. Go to your hotel rooms and look at it some more. And then we have about an hour and a half tomorrow to really debate it and work with it. So I think that should be all right. We're going to try to get the three subcommittees in in the following order, scope, Cold War, and outreach. We still haven't figured out where Reed is, uh, but we're trying. So uh, we have a fallback position, I think, if Reed is not here, as to who will present the report on the outreach committee. But if I could just turn to um, Duncan, and if you could start the report on the scope committee, that would be great. The scope, <coughs> the scope committee met three times uh, since our last meeting. Uh, once face-to-face -face at the last meeting in collaboration with the, the Cold War Committee, and then again in collaboration with the Cold War Committee, we had a second uh, telephone conversation, and then the Scope Committee met by itself in, uh, uh, by telephone conference last week. While we were talking with this Cold War subcommittee, the focus of our discussion was on the medical experiments. And so Marianne and I have worked out that uh, she would describe our, our thinking, our joint thinking on the uh, medical experiments when she gets her turn. So I'm going to try to be brief here and just simply talk, focus my remarks on the intentional releases. Um, first of all, the, it's, most of our discussion has been focused on trying to draw the limits as to uh, what we should consider and what we, we would not consider. In the process, it might have gotten lost in the shuffle that there is a list of things that we were supposed to talk about as enumerated in the executive order. And we wanted to reinforce that that's, in fact, our first priority. Uh, and staff is encouraged to go ahead and continue to uh, explore Green Run and all of the other examples that are listed there. Uh, nevertheless, as an immediate priority, we thought it was worth pushing ahead with further documentation on some of these things we're calling borderline incidents. In order to help us get an early reading uh, as to what our, our priorities should be for the extent to which we wish to pursue each of these. Uh, we have at least a working definition of what we mean by an experiment. And uh, why don't I read it to you? Uh, an environmental release should be designated as, quote, experimental if it was done for the primary purpose of testing human health effects or the extent of human exposures. Uh, and that's wording that's taken pretty much right out of the executive order with the exception of the insertion of the word primary. Uh, and whether we want to continue to keep that word pr primary purpose in there uh, as part of our definition of an experimental release is something that we might wish to discuss some more. I suggest the use of a different word, and I suggest we call a study, uh, the observation of human health effects potentially relate, resulting from environmental exposures. Uh, these exposures might be further subdivided into intentional or accidental or even natural. Uh, these are terms which await further, more rigorous definition, but it, uh, I think we have a pretty clear idea in our heads as to what we mean by them. Uh, and I. I think I speak for the subcommittee when I say that the extent to which we consider such studies at all, at all we might limit consideration to the, just that subgroup of intentional exposures, setting aside the accidental or, or natural exposures. But that, too, is a point that uh, I think we should continue to, to debate. Now, uh, that then leads us to the question of criteria for prioritizing the, the various options. At our last discussion, Ken came up with four criteria which are particularly important. First of all, was it experimental? Are there likely to have been medical consequences? Were there, quote, bad government activities, and do issues of liability arise from them? And do there remain unanswered questions? Of course, foremost in uh, our minds with regard to the last ones are the secrecy aspects. And uh, there's a general consensus that we really do need to focus on the, the 
the secrecy aspects of these things. Let me just add a couple of additional points that uh, from another list which I compiled. Uh, there's some overlap here. The level of risk that's implicit in uh, Ken's second criterion, whether further secret aspects of the story remain to be told. What information was provided to the subject at the time, especially whether, intentional, whether intentionally misleading information was provided but also whether the information was subsequently proved to be wrong. And that is in light of what we now know about radiation risks. Extent to which the purpose of the exposure was to study adverse health effects. Uh, that's touched on in our definition. Whether potentially beneficial treatments or uh, exposure remediation was denied. These issues come up in a number of circumstances. Uh, and finally, whether the subjects had the op option to refuse to participate uh, in either the exposure or in the subsequent medical follow-up. So the, those are some of the issues which uh, we think we need to think about in the context of each one of these ins instances. Now, uh, we still have some trepidation about passing judgment on uh, each of these borderline cases at this preliminary stage of our deliberations. Uh, in particular, we feel like we we would really like to hear more from the various groups that are directly affected uh, who are intensely asking us questions like, is our situation going to be included or not? Um, so there's some temptation simply not to give any clue at this point as to what we're thinking. But I think for the purpose of moving the debate along, it would probably be useful to give some indications as to the general line of our, of our thinking on each of the borderline cases that we've discussed in the past. Uh, let me make clear at this point that the purpose is not to uh, make an absolute in or out recommendation. It's, I think, our view that to some extent everything is in, uh, but that there will be distinctions made in terms of the, the depth to which we decide to pursue things. But uh, each of the examples which I'm going to go through in a moment are, are all part of the Cold War story and need to be told to some extent, whether we actually go into the details of them or not. Um, I, I say this because the staff has received innumerable requests from various organizations saying, are you going to consider our particular cir circumstance? And I think we'd like to be able to, to tell them that, yes, to at least to some extent, we are going to be thinking about your issues and we would like to hear from you. Um, with that disclaimer, let me read through a brief list of, of items that we have been talking about and give you some of our preliminary thoughts about them. Um, let me begin with the Marshall Islanders. Uh, I understand we're going to be hearing from uh, a delegation of them later this afternoon. So the purpose is, is of course, not to uh, prejudge whatever it is they may say to us. Um, I think there's abundant evidence that the Marshall Islanders were exposed to some substantial doses of fallout, uh, and there's some well-documented adverse health effects. The crux of the issue that we need to think about is whether this uh, constituted an experiment in, in any sense of the word. They were probably not adequately informed about the risks at the time. Um, there is a possibility that they may have been deliberately misinformed, although uh, I have yet to see the, the documentation of that claim. Uh, and I don't know what kinds of options they might have had to refuse. So the, not, the crux of the question regarding the Marshall Islanders is as to whether or not there was an experimental purpose in their relocation back into uh, contaminated homelands. And I think the Marshall Islanders themselves may be one of our best leads in terms of whatever documentary evidence they've uncovered in uh, the latest boxes of material that was just released by DOE. The atomic veterans are the next group of concern. Um, here there, there seemed to me to be a division between two types of exposures. Um, there is the The, the, the cleanup activities of contaminated ships, for example, at the uh, Bikini Atolls and elsewhere, where 
uh, there was considerable concern about the radiation safety activity of it and of this activity. And in my view, this represents an occupational hazard, but not anything that has, in, in, in any sense that I can see, a clear experimental purpose involved. Then there are other activities where, where uh, it was felt that it's important to understand something or other about uh, the performance of soldiers on a nuclear battlefield where it's very difficult for me to see how this can be construed as anything other than experimental in nature. Now, in this regard, we have recently uncovered a document uh, which has now been circulated, I believe, to all of the committee members. And it's worth uh, just saying a few words about this document. And I think there'll probably be more extensive discussion on this tomorrow when we have the briefing on the document retrieval process from DOD. Um, this document consists of a series of, of minutes and uh, background documents from the Working Group on Military Requirements for Observation of Human Volunteers. Uh, let me take you through this document and highlight a few things that you ought to be looking at to think about it. Now, mine looks a little bit thicker than what other people have been referred to, so I may have a few things that, that not all of the committee has. Um, the first document that I have is the Joint Panel on Medical Aspects of Atomic Warfare, dated February 19, 1950, the report of a working group on military requirements for observation on human volunteers. Um, Eli, do you have that? Is that the same thing? Okay. Probably the thing to do is to flip down to page four of this document. Duncan, there is a bit of a problem because you do have a thicker document. The, the committee uh, has the uh, agenda eighth meeting with the excerpt. Duncan, I had given as the scope chairman, just because we got these documents last Friday, the surrounding context so we could make sense. So you all, when you get to the eighth meeting agenda, that's when you can have the same documentation, Duncan. Okay. Well, I, I think, nevertheless, I'm going to read just two short excerpts from this first document the rest of you haven't yet received, um, which help put into context uh, the, what it now appears to be a really rather extensive debate uh, as to whether or not the military should be undertaking some program of uh, experimentation on humans. Um, Rather than try to organize these comments in any logical sequence, I'm simply going to go through them in the order in which I have them here. The first quote is as follows. Many individuals feel that we have sufficient data on humans to give these answers. This was preceded by an extensive discussion as to what the various questions were that were of military importance. Uh, others feel that they do not, do not have adequate information, and therefore some human experimentation should be done on military volunteers to whom the effects of ionizing radiation have been explained in detail. A little further down the page, it says, the advisory panel then had a long discussion of the problem of human experimentation. And it was the consensus of this group that human experimentation was probably not the answer at this time, due to the fact that in order to obtain statistically significant results, several thousand people would have to be exposed to ionizing radiation. Uh, Dr. Shields Warren expressed his opinion that sufficient data was already at hand. Well, this begins to give you uh, a little bit of a sense of the discussion, that there was a really uh, quite compelling need to answer a number of important questions about how uh, soldiers would perform in a nuclear battlefield and other questions relating to uh, defense aspects of uh, how we should protect ourselves in the event of a nuclear attack. And that the Army had a real dilemma on their hands as to how they could get this information in any other means other than by human experimentation. I'm flipping now down to the agenda for the eighth meeting of the same joint panel on the medical aspects of atomic warfare. And now, is this something... This is the document everybody have? should have. Okay. Um, yes. Let me read just uh, into the record the second paragraph of item one on the front page of his document. It is therefore requested that the Joint Panel on Medical Aspects of Atomic Warfare 
be requested to submit for approval jointly by the Committee on Medical Sciences and the Committee on Atomic Energy a statement of the medical and biomedical information they consider essential for the Department of Defense to obtain through participation in atomic weapons tests conducted in the future uh, without regard to a specific type or location of the test. So what this is saying is uh, at this point, we have not yet undertaken any human experimentation. We are asking this panel to put together a research program. And a little further down in the document, we begin to get some more details as to what this uh, program might consist of. Um, I direct your attention down to page 5. Now, uh, there's really quite a lot of things that are outlined in the shopping list of things that are of potential interest. I've just highlighted a few of these, which sound to me like it would be difficult to get this information in any other way than by human experimentation. Item 9, internal contamination of survivors of a contaminating burst. Item 11, effects of exposure to the eye in an atomic flash. Uh, item 16, measurements of the concentration of radioactive particles within pressurized aircraft. Item uh, 21, Studies of the inhalation and ingestion of radioactive materials in a fallout zone. 22, the retention of inhaled radioactive materials. 24, measurement of radioactive isotopes in the body fluids of atomic weapons test personnel. 29, psycho psychophysiological changes after exposure to nuclear explosions. So here we have laid out something of a shopping list of, of experiments that were considered by this panel as providing information that the military needed to have. What we don't have, there is any evidence yet that any of these studies were actually undertaken. Uh, but scattered throughout here, and I think Dan might want to comment some more, when, if, if not now, tomorrow, various leads to further documentation that must have resulted from uh, the deliberations of this panel. And uh, I, I think it, it gives us some leads now to pursue this story a little bit further and find out whether or not the military did in fact carry out human experiments uh, for military purposes. Jay, did you want to? Yes, I just add something. Yes. Uh, you want to provoke me because it struck me in reading it a few minutes ago uh, that it says on page two. Uh, uh, Towards the end, uh, any such detonation should be the occasion of a carefully planned biomedical program. To be methodological discouraged, however, is the type of thinking which leads to the inclusion of animals at a test merely because they are test structures to which to please them. And then it goes on about animals. It doesn't say anything, the same things about human beings. And, and in a sense, uh, saying, look, you've got to be careful with human beings also. And, and not just include them. At least I, don't, I didn't see anything in the document that specifically refers to human beings. It did so with respect to animals. Yeah, I would agree with that. Anyway, it's, it's clearly there was a very lively debate about these issues mm -hmm. uh, at the time. Henry wanted to get in, Duncan. I have a better sort of angle of vision here than you do. So. There's a handwritten note on all of the pages. Uh, is this when it was declassified, uh, June 23rd, 94? When was this document declassified? Uh, we ca I can't tell for sure. This is when the, uh, we, uh, if I can give the context of this for uh, just two seconds. Duncan did an excellent job of uh, overview. Jim David, our staff person, about several weeks ago had noted there was this joint panel of the Defense Department, which was created in 1949. Your briefing books in tab O has the, ba the charter for the panel. After Jim discovered it, we asked the Defense Department to go get us as much as they could of further documentation, and we received from the Defense Department last week. And June 23rd is, I guess, when they pulled it out of the archives, not necessarily when it was declassified. It's not clear when it was declassified. It was declassified. It was declassified stamp. It was dated 23 June. Well, I, I'm, I'm not an expert. Uh, Jim's not here, but he can tell you. I've gone through this with Jim before. The dates here are not necessarily in the, the, what the archives do when they give it out. May not. Be, there's a technical ar archive arcana here. If I can, can I just make a couple of other comments that I think may provide context? One, uh, of course, we're looking at fragments of a story that 
may or may not have been uh, buried for a long period. The first point Duncan referred to in the documents which she has, and you're all, of course, get copies of the contextual debate about whether or not there should be human experimentation. And what's odd is it seems as if while that debate is ongoing, simultaneously there is some level of experimentation. So that, for example, uh, there are certain things we know to be experiments of human nature, like the Medical College of Virginia, whether it was a bad or good or radiation or not, appears to be a human experiment mm -hmm. that was ongoing. And we see a similar pattern in the case of the AEC, where there's this constant debate about whether or not it should be done, but at some level it's going on. The second point as to where this document lies, as I said, uh, Jim discovered that there was this panel. And of course, we've asked for everything related to it. And DOD was very good in giving us at least the beginning, the fragmentary uh, meeting minutes and so forth. After this eighth meeting, which you all have, uh, the only other documentation we have is a 10th and 11th meeting where it appears that, in fact, there were discussion of the biomedical plans for particular tests. In addition, there were further items on human experimentation on the agenda. We don't have the substance of those discussions. We uh, suspect that uh, by the time it got to the 11th meeting in 1953, there was a reorganization of DOD Defense Department, so that this became a different group. And of course, we're interested in it. But the, the long and the short of it is the present trail is that it looks like in some form, of course, they went ahead with biomedical research related to atomic testing. The question is what, if anything, had to do with human beings? That is a question. Yeah, I just want to say one more thing about the veterans before moving on to the other groups. Uh, one of the issues which we'll have to address is whether or not, in fact, the, uh, any of the veterans were indeed harmed by the, their exposures. Uh, as I suspect probably most of you are aware, there have been a series of studies of the, uh, the health of the veterans exposed, of the atomic veterans. And these studies have come in for some criticism. We heard that uh, message from Pat Brody at the last uh, public comment period. Uh, without wanting to prejudge this issue, there is one p news item which I wanted to alert this committee to, that there is, uh, at the moment, a National Academies Committee which is reviewing these studies. And uh, they're expecting to have a report out in a matter of a few weeks or perhaps a few months. Um, so I, I think we can do nothing more other than can simply wait and see what they come up with. No, it's fine. OK. Well, let me move on then to the next group, uh, which uh, we've had some discussion about, which are the uranium miners. Now, in my view, the uranium miners represent a very sad chapter in the history of public health. Uh, these miners were uh, exposed to enormous levels of, of radon, and they have suffered uh, a terrible burden in terms of their lung cancer incidence. Uh, the latest estimates are that there's probably something like about 250 preventable deaths that occurred in this group. Uh, I'm going to have some more to say about this at some later point when I give a briefing on, on uh, radiation risks. Um, the question that we have to address now is whether there's any experimental purpose involved. I, for one, find it very difficult to see an experimental purpose. But Jay has raised concerns that, whether experimental or not, that there are serious ethical issues in terms of the, the behavior of U.S. Public Health Service in addressing these concerns. This is, I think, a, a deep and important ethical issue which we need to talk about as a committee and I'd suggest we you know, make it an agenda item for one of our future meetings uh, and pursue this to some level. Um, anyway, that's my take on it at the moment, that there's not a clear experimental purpose. It's hard for us to see how this is part of uh, our mandate uh, as, as described in the Charter. There are nevertheless, uh, it is an important part of the Cold War story. There are some interesting ethical issues to be deba debated. Uh, I should also mention at this point a uh, potential conflict of interest uh, in that I have been myself involved in some reanalyses of the data from the, from the minor data and the minor study. And uh, I think the panel has, you've now circulated to the panel uh, one of my publications on that subject. And I'll just let you people read it and uh, judge for yourself and be happy to see, defer to what the committee decides about whether this, I have a serious conflict. Uh, 
The next group is the downwinders. Again, I need to announce a conflict of interest. Uh, in this case, I think a, substan a more substantial one, in as much as I was one of the senior investigators and the people uh, downwind of the Nevada test site. And again, two of my publications on this subject have been circulated to the committee, which you can, you can decide upon. Uh, here's one where I think I probably should step back and uh, let someone else carry the ball. And I, by, I've given now the committee the, 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 the entree into this literature, and you can pursue it yourself. Many of the same questions arise. It's hard, again, to see an experimental purpose uh, in the downwinders. Um, there were nevertheless ethical concerns about the quality of the information uh, that was provided to the population, indeed possible you know, actual conscious misrepresentations of the truth. Uh, and the main thing which I, I think this committee might want to address is the extent to which the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, uh, both for the downwinders as well as the uranium miners and the atomic veterans, has been effective in providing a reasonable response to these issues. Then finally, there's a number of groups which I think we probably don't want to consider, but I should mention for the record, uh, worker studies around DOE facilities, uh, of DOE workers. Uh, to me, this is just clearly uh, occupational hygiene. And there's no real experimental purpose involved. I think it seems to me we should set them aside. And I don't think there's been any serious dis anyone seriously proposed that we ought to consider the workers. Um, the one exception here is we have every now and then stumbled upon examples where uh, laboratory workers were enrolled as study subjects and were asked to drink or be injected various radionuclides. Uh, in this, these instances, I think we simply handle them uh, along with all of the other uh, the medical experiments. So we don't need to make a particular distinction. There are, of course, some slightly different ethical concerns that arise uh, in the use of, of workers as, as study subjects. Uh, in particular, some ones which I recently stumbled upon relating to uh, uh, the, the children of the workers being enrolled as study subjects. This is something I think we're probably going to want to comment on. Uh, routine releases from DOE facilities is another one uh, where, with the exception of the intentional releases like Green Run, it's hard to see any experimental purpose. Uh, we need to say something or other about them to help put in context uh, the intentional releases to say, for example, that the releases from Green Run, as one example, would be uh, just a very small portion of the overall releases from Hanford, from which uh, there might indeed have been some health demonstrable health effects, and there is a major study underway now to address just that question. So I think uh, that wraps it up. Floor is open for discussion. Um, scope questions to the scope, scope committee. Members of the scope committee, <coughs> subcommittee. Ken. Let me uh, start off by concurring in what, uh, in what Duncan has said as a member of the subcommittee. I think that it is a mistake if we draw too many crystallized conclusions yet, as Duncan points out, as to what's in and out of the report. Um, the, way I, the way I would evaluate the next few months for the committee, based on the subcommittee's report, it would be first, we have looked at various aids to assist us in getting the facts, even on some that would appear to be outside the scope as being clearly non-experimental. The subcommittee has talked to the staff about taking advantage of reams of congressional testimony and, and outside historian research and other shortcut aids to try and see whether there's cer a, a certain sort of jurisdictional prerequisite that can be met that somehow certain um, activities would fall within the mandate of this committee's charter. 
So I do think that Duncan is absolutely right when he recommends on behalf of the entire subcommittee that we not write off anybody yet. And if anybody believes that they fall within the scope of our charter, we should hear what they have to say in order to, uh, before making any final decision. That's sort of a methodological point. Put another way, there are some, uh, there are some activities that clearly fall within our charter, some that may fall within our charter, and some that apparently don't fall within our charter, but we haven't drawn any conclusions yet. The second thing I would say is that insofar as we tell in our report the whole picture, even if there may be activities that are tangential or even outside the mandate of the committee's charter, it may be in telling the whole story that reference to certain activities is perfectly appropriate without getting into any great detail or getting to the bottom line. It may be that a full and fair and accurate picture, uh, it, may make, it may be worthwhile to make reference to certain activities that may not be part of our charter and may not be within our scope, but are part of the story. That gets to the next point, which to me is, in terms of drafting or recommending any remedy, remedies, again, it's premature to talk about what the, how we will articulate those remedies how much detail we will want to get into, whether that falls beyond the scope of our charter even as to know experiments. How much in the way are we talking in the remedy area in terms of guidelines, recommendations for generic um, remedies, or are we talking about X should get Y dollars or Z should get T dollars or whatever? I think it's premature, but the reason I lay out this point, picking up on Duncan's point, just as it may be possible, A, for us not to exclude anybody yet, pending more discovery, <coughs> And B, just as it may be possible in telling the whole story to make reference to certain events that may be outside of our charter but can be referred to, so too, depending on what our recommendations look like, it may be a relatively simple task to say, for example, that generically, if we are recommending that a certain process be established to assure ethical peer review in the future, if we are recommending that, that, that compensation not be discussed, but, be, but guidelines for compensation or for remedies be established for certain experiments, it may be that similar guidelines, the same guidelines, can apply to any number of government activities assuming that the guidelines themselves have been met. So I guess the way I come out on this, and it's premature, but the way I lean at the present time, I think in consistent with what Duncan is saying, and consistent with what I think Henry and the rest of the subcommittee is thinking, Jay and others, it is that A, it is premature to draw any conclusions yet. B, certain, clear, uh, certain government activities are more clearly within our mandate or charter than others. But that C, we have to discover what there is using various t uh, methodological mechanisms that are out there. Congressional testimony and the Marshall Islanders, there's library full of, of, of materials there, for example. Uranium miners, the same. Atomic veterans, the same. And then decide in the next few months, are there any of these government activities that are clearly out for all purposes, 
Are there some clearly in for all purposes? And is there this gray area where, well, they, they, it's a stretch, but in terms of prospective remedy and prospective recommendation, we might as well have included them because there's no reason, good reason not to include them in terms of generic or guidelines types of recommendations concerning remedy. Final point, I am concerned about the danger of making what we think are reasonable distinctions as to certain activities being included and some being excluded that will be perceived by some to be invidious discrimination and divisive. And I'm not, sh I'm not sure that it's necessary. I don't know yet. It all depends, I think, on what the facts um, demonstrate and how we decide as a stylistic matter to fashion the remedies or the prospective recommendations because that may help us avoid a perception that we're being unfair. Uh, so I, I, I think that just is, is, I'm just trying to build on what Duncan says in the way of going step by step by step, shutting the door on nobody, raising concerns which we will address in time. Anyway. I'm uh, here reasonably comfortable about the work of the scope committee in terms of defining the scope of uh, what this committee is supposed to be doing, the scope, scope subcommittee, um, because I think it's impossible if you're going to tell the Cold War story, for example, not to be pretty much all-inclusive. All uh, what troubles me is the priorities part of the scope. Um, it seems to me that we're gathering a lot of information and we're not thinking about how we're going to use that information. Uh, for example, let's, let's take informed consent. Um, uh, what are the rules going to be about uh, informed consent? Are uh, investigators going to be um, uh, innocent until proven guilty? Or is the lack of finding a piece of paper that has written informed consent going to um, uh, be an indication that adequate, uh, that, that informed consent was not obtained? Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if we find a piece of paper, are we going to assume that adequate informed consent was obtained? Uh, it's, it seems to me there are a lot of issues related to uh, informed consent, these in and out criteria uh, in the remedies that are going to take an awful lot of work uh, to, uh, to agree upon, and we haven't given that task the priority that I think it should get. Uh, maybe we haven't given it the priority because intrinsically we realize how difficult that's going to be, but it's not going to get any easier by putting it off. Are you suggesting that we specifically ask the scope subcommittee to take that issue on, those sets of issues on? <laughs> I'm under the heading of priorities which you already have as part of your the, territory um, it's not clear to me that the people who are on the scope subcommittee are necessarily the best, the best people. people to decide about each of those different issues um, well, uh, but I think they're important issues to as a, address as a practical matter let me suggest that it would be very helpful if you could articulate what the, in, in some specifics, the questions that you've just described. We can take them back and reapportion in terms of thinking about who should be doing some preliminary cuts on those questions. The only, the only way that work's going to get done, I think, is if we identify it, flag it, and make it somebody's responsibility. So it would be very helpful, Henry. I can't, I can't be very articulate about it as yet. I, I will refer to it with maybe from a different perspective, a little bit more articulately tomorrow. But it all depends on what questions we're going to ask us with respect to what Ken uh, said and also what Henry just said. It seems to me there's an overall question, really goes beyond informed consent, 
is here we do know uh, that people were misused, people were deceived, people were used uh, by others in all kinds of ways. And how was this possible in a democratic society that really espouses to certain values of self-determination, autonomy, relative openness? How did these people get the authority and or how did they assume the authority in doing what they were doing? I think that is very inarticulately put at the moment, a question we have to ask ourselves and to wrestle with a bit, and primarily also for the purpose, what can we ultimately recommend that these kinds of things will not happen in the way in which they happened in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. There probably will be in the future secret experiments. There, uh, there probably uh, will be studies because of quote unquote national emergencies that we had in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. But who should authorize them? Because uh, as I read these documents, these, many of these things just happen. In, in, uh, in thoughtless fashion without really thinking through what the issues were to the extent to which it was possible to uh, think them through. And this is, I hope, will be one of the contributions that we can make to the future. We've got Pat and, and Pam on that subject, or others. Well, I, if Jay can say he pleads uh, fear of being articulate, I can do the same thing. But with the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, in articulate. The, the, when I was listening to the report of the subcommittee, the phrase that gave me trouble, and I, there's some other things, but other people have spoken to them, I won't repeat it. The phrase that gave me trouble was experimental purpose. And the reason that the phrase experimental purpose gave me trouble is because it gets to answering things when the questions should still be open. Uh, let me see if I can articulate that. When the, when the National Commission, who, because it understood that it was making recommendations that might be federal regulations, debated what should be considered research, we adopted a formulation um, that I understood, and I think those of us who worked on it understood, but it wasn't a formulation that worked for every purpose, every conceivable purpose. It worked for a very narrow purpose of regulation. Um, at that time, the debate was, if you were patient subject A, and you were over in hospital A, and you're subject B, and you're in, in hospital B, did it matter to you um, as subjects whether the person who manipulated your body did so after having a written protocol uh, that told how, uh, what the method was going to be, and what, it, what hypothesis it was, with the hope that it would generalize knowledge. And over in Hospital B, you had somebody that said, gee, it would be a good idea to see how this subject would react if I did exactly the same intervention. Now, the National Commission called the first one, that was a very simplistic description, called the first one research. It called the second one sort of nothing, if you understand what I mean. It was innovative therapy. It was bad research. It was a whole range of things. What always struck me was that from the perspective of the subject, they didn't really care. The same thing was done to exactly the same, same thing, two different people, calling them one research and something else made absolutely no difference to them if they were both equally injured. Mm -hmm. Part of what I think I hear today, and the reason I got trouble with the term exper experimental purpose, was it seems to me that if we look at current research, we operate with implicitly with an understanding of what research is. And that understanding does not take account of opportunity. When we look at the history, we get more confused. Because for one, the, the idea of what is research or what was research is not as explicit, I think, or as clear as it is today. But more importantly, we keep running across areas where it was hard to say there were necessarily protocols. 
and things were done and all the I's dotted and the T's crossed, but where people said, ha, huh, great opportunity. You know, it's sort of like Tuskegee, great opportunity. Uh, let us see what now we can find out and even not always putting it in a protocol. This goes back a little bit to what Ken says. I don't know if, the, if I'm being articulate, but I'd love to see the subcommittee try to give a range of definitions that it is using, or at least to define more appropriately its term experimental purpose. Experimental purpose to me says, gee, everything turns on whatever intent those who were in charge of the manip manipulation had in mind. Uh, and that's a funny way to make the scope fall, that it's the intent of the people who did the funding or the intent of the people who were doing the research. Um, that may be an appropriate definition for some purposes. It may not be for others. Um, the reason I say that is because in explaining this story, it may be very important that the public, which will operate on different understandings of what is research, understands a range of understanding that may operate. Um, it may even be important to point out that scientists have certain things in mind. Uh, but if you're not a scientist, you may look at other things and consider that experimentation or research. So I think that what I heard Ken alluding to is, and maybe he'll correct me, I'm sure, if I misjudged him, is that um, lawyers often understand that where you want to end up may have a lot to do with how you define things. Um, and what I'm pleading for, because we're in this big open area is that we think now about a range of ways of range with no conclusion, a range of ways of defining, and maybe that's a bad term, defining what it is that we're talking about. An experimental purpose, when you say something did not have an experimental purpose, doesn't always do it for me because there may be situations where I can't identify that quote experimental purpose that I think that for all other relevant reasons might be a, a virtually identical to one that you might describe as having an experimental purpose. That is really inarticulate, but I'm hoping mm -hmm. that I'm um, getting to uh, what I think we need to think about in trying to think about scope. I would only wish to be as inarticulate as all of our <laughs> committee members who protest about the inarticulateness. It would, be, it, would, it would do well. Ken, did you still have a comment? Uh, just in response to Henry and to uh, Patricia, um, I don't think that the priorities concern that Henry expressed is, um, is as serious as Henry might think. Because all I'm suggesting is that as a methodological matter, in terms of staff, uh, man hours, person hours, for purposes of doing the research, engaging what's out there, I pick up on Duncan's point, and that is that there are certain mass exposures uh, that are in a range, going from uh, the, the Marshall Islanders all the way to the uranium miners or the atomic veterans or the Nagasaki survivors or what have you. There is a range. And that for these mass exposures, this committee doesn't have the time, the resources to reinvent the wheel. That's all I think the scope subcommittee was suggesting, that the door is open, but that in terms of these mass exposures, call them experiments, call them experiments plus, call them probably not experiments, even under a liberal uh, definition that Patricia talks about, the staff ought to be directed to focus on the readily available research that's been done for, for years on these people rather than begin anew, can't be done. The Marshall Islanders, they're, they're, they're a con the congressional testimony takes up a library. The same with the atomic ven uh, veterans, the same with others, mm -hmm. it seems. And uh, I want to make it clear, all I'm suggesting as a methodological point is that, that we should, on the mass exposure side, rely on what we know, or what's out there already, supplemented by public comment or interview or anybody that will give us additional leads, historians or what have you, leading to a conclusion 
sooner rather than later, okay. that we know enough. I mean, we could continue to get every last bit of information. But in terms of a decision and remedy that will allow us either directly or indirectly to include certain groups, certain exposures in a recommendation, we have enough corroboration so that we can go forward. Uh, absent the type of, of um, comprehensive global search that may be required by staff in areas specifically mentioned in the charter that Duncan refers to. So I really think that this discussion that I've had with Duncan and with Henry and with Patricia, there is no real disagreement, mm -hmm. at least not yet. <laughs> there may be. There may be at some point. But all I'm suggesting is that we have a limited number of staff, a limited amount of time, and we have to focus that time on best we, and staff on best we can. Let me let me pick up on your. Oh, I'm sorry, Kat. I was just.